Finally, as promised, a special comment in the wake of the passage of health care reform, and it's a first step. There's a lot wrong with it, but the penalty for not paying the fine, for not buying the mandatory insurance, has now been reduced to nothing. So blessings on those who took this first step. Pat yourselves on the back, and tomorrow morning get back to work fixing what is still wrong with our American health care system. These remarks tonight are more about our political climate in the wake of this bill's passage. Eight days ago, a 16-year-old kid picked up a courtesy phone at a store in Washington Township, New Jersey, and announced over the public address system, quote, attention Walmart customers, all black people leave the store now, unquote. The boy has been arrested and charged with harassment and bias intimidation. Two days ago, a Tea Party protester shouted the N-word at Congressman John Lewis of Georgia, one of the heroes of 20th century America, and Congressman Andre Carson of Indiana. And another shouted anti-gay slurs at Congressman Barney Frank of Massachusetts. Capitol Hill police confirmed no arrests were made, and there were no serious efforts to identify the vermin involved. Television, print, and radio news organizations will not be asked to turn over their tapes and images of the event, nor subpoenaed if necessary. This is not to dismiss what the 16-year-old did in New Jersey, but it would seem that what was shouted at the congressman merits at least as much investigation and hopefully as much prosecution. After all, it did occur inside the halls of Congress, a place at least as crowded as and as sanctified as a Walmart. But in a backwards, sick-to-my-stomach way, I would like to thank whoever shouted at Mr. Lewis and Mr. Carson for proving my previous point. If racism is not the whole of the Tea Party, it is in its heart, along with blind hatred, a total disinterest in the welfare of others, and a full-flowered, self-rationalizing refusal to accept the outcomes of elections, or the reality of democracy, or the narrowness of their minds, and the equal narrowness of their public support. On Saturday, that support came from evolutionary regressives like Michelle Bachman and John Voigt. On a daily basis, that support comes from the racists and homophobes of radio and television, the Michael Savages and the Rush Limbaugh's. Shockingly, that support even comes on a specific basis from another congressman, Republican Devin Nunez of the California 21st. When you use totalitarian tactics, people, you know, begin to act crazy, he said on C-SPAN. And I think, you know, there's people that have every right to say what they want. If they want to smear someone, they can do it. Congressman Nunez, you should resign. You have no business opening the door for a man like John Lewis, let alone serving alongside him. And if you shouldn't resign for your endorsement, your encouragement of the most vile, the most reprehensible, and the most outdated spewings of the lizard brain part of this country, you should resign because of your total disconnect from reality. There have been no totalitarian tactics, Congressman. People, these few sad people, have begun to act crazy because it has been the dedicated purpose, the sole method and sole function of the Republican Party to entice them to act crazy. Those shouts against the congressman, Mr. Nunez, were inspired not by what people like John Lewis have done in their lives. They have been inspired by what people like you have done in the last year. And so the far right escalates the rhetoric and the level of threat just a little more. And worse still, it escalates the level of delusion. The election of a Democratic president is socialism. The election of a black president is an international conspiracy. The enactment of any health care reform is an apocalypse. And the willful denial of reality by the leader of the minority party in Congress is the only truth. A willful denial, incidentally, that includes the leader of the minority party in Congress, ignoring the fact that his is the minority party, and that he represents the minority, and that despite having broken all the rules of decorum in place in this nation since the end of the Civil War, that despite having played every trick, mean and low, despite having the limitless financial backing of one of the biggest cartels in the world, he and his cronies and the manufactured outrage of the Tea Party failed to derail health care reform failed, Mr. Boehner. You lost. You blew it. Shame on each and every one of you who substitutes your will and your desires above those of your fellow countrymen, you said last night just before the vote. The will and desire of your countrymen, Mr. Boehner. If you're one of the leaders of a party that in four years coughed up the Senate majority, coughed up the House majority, coughed up the White House, coughed up health care reform, and along the way ignored every poll and every election result, I would think the will and desires of your fellow countrymen should be pretty damn clear by now. Your countrymen think your policies are of the past and your tactics are of the gutter. But Boehner's teary shame on you over the tyranny of the vast majority taking a scrap back from the elite clueless minority. That's just an isolated incident.
Just as Congressman Nagabauer shouting baby killer at or it's a baby killer during Congressman Stupak's laudable speech last night was just an isolated incident. Just as the shouting of the N-words at Congressman Lewis and Carson was just an isolated incident. Just as the spitting on Congressman Cleaver was just an isolated incident. Just as the abuse of Congressman Frank was just an isolated incident. Just as the ethnic slurs shouted at Congressman Rodriguez of Texas was just an isolated incident. Just as the oinking by Congressman Wilson during the president's address was just an isolated incident. Just as whatever is next will just be an isolated incident. You know what they call it when you have a once a week series of isolated incidents? They call it two things. They call it a pattern, and in the United States of 2010, they call it the Republican Party. American political parties have disappeared before. They are never forced out by their rivals. They die by their own hands only because they did not know that the hatred or the myopia or the monomania they thought was still okay wasn't okay anymore. And so I offer this olive branch to the defeated Republicans and Tea Partiers. It is a cold olive branch. It is scarred. There aren't many olives on it, but it still counts. You are rapidly moving from the party of no, past the party of no conscience, towards the party of no relevancy. You are behind the wheel of a political Toyota. And before the midterms, you will have been reduced to only being this generation's home for the nuts. You will be the flat earthers, the isolationists, the segregationists, the John Birchers. Stop. Certainly you must recognize the future is with the humane, the inclusive, the diverse. It is with America. Not the America of 1910, but the America of 2010. Discard this dangerous, separatist, elitist, backward-looking rhetoric, and you will be welcomed back into the political discourse of this nation. But continue with it, and you will destroy yourselves in whatever righteous causes you actually believe in. And on the way, you will damage this country in ways and manners untold. But even that damage will not be permanent. Faubus and the McNamara brothers and Bull Connor and Lindbergh and Joe McCarthy damaged this nation. We survived, and they were swept away by history. You cannot destroy this country, no matter how hard you seem to be trying to, nor can you destroy this country's inexorable march towards the light. The Belgian Nobel Prize winner Maurice Metterlink once wrote that, quote, at every crossroads on the path that leads to the future, tradition has placed 10,000 men to guard the past. Last night, those 10,000 men fell. Good night and good luck.